It's okay. Okay. There we go. I think we're streaming now. I never know the exact minute though. That's why it's kind of weird. It's all right. <laughs> as long as I don't say anything uh, too uh, controversial. Hey everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. My guest today is Dora Stone from Dora's Table. It's so cool. She has a blog in English and Spanish. I love that, two different ones. She was on the show before competing against the also beautiful Alejandra Graf in an Iron Chef, and they both proved what extraordinary chefs they were. So they're each coming back for their own episode, and today is Dora's turn. She is going to be doing Mexican gone vegan, and she's going to be making a cauliflower ceviche. Please welcome back to the show, Dora Stone. It's very nice to see you again. Hi, everybody. It's nice to be back. It's great. Great to be here. I love that, you know, you're doing Mexican gone vegan because I think of, of all the ethnicities, Mexican is one of the easiest to veganize. Would you agree? Yes, I definitely would. I would agree. You know, I mean, because it's, it's the flavors are... I, I mean, they're just such great flavors, number one. And I grew up in LA where we're like Tex, -Me I mean, Mexican, I mean, you don't have to be Mexican to enjoy Mexican food, let's just say, because I feel bad for parts of the, the country where like, they can't get Mexican food other than, yeah. you know, and, and, and just like, I mean, textures, you've got things like mushrooms. If you, you know, you could do like carnitas, you can do out of jackfruit. So I think veganizing Mexican food, it might be the easiest of all. You know, it lends itself very well. The basis of the cuisine is really corn corn, beans, tomatoes, chile. So that's really the base of the whole cuisine. So it's very easy to kind of decolonize it and take away the animal products and the butter and the cheese and just kind of go back to the roots of the cuisine itself. Right. And, you know, if you eat traditional cuisine, of, like if, if you eat rice and beans, you're going to be healthy. You're not going to be overweight. But it's when people from countries where they eat Mexican food eat our version of it, then not yeah. so much. You know what I mean? Yeah. Lots of cheese. <laughs> yeah, that's it. But we can even replace that now. We've got all the ways to do it, either homemade or buy them. So it's it's really, yeah. nothing, there's really nothing you can't make Mexican anymore, whether it's flan or chili rellenos that, 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 that's not vegan. And, and you can also do it healthy vegan too. Yes, that's true. That's very yeah. true. It's very easy. Yeah. So what made you decide to go vegan? And I, I'm assuming, I mean, I'm hoping your family eats your food because it's delicious. Yeah. I've been vegan, vegan for about six years. And I had a health problem and I couldn't get the doctors just couldn't, they couldn't help me They just kept giving me medication and kind of treating the symptoms, but not getting to the root of the problem. And I had a friend who I was living in California at the time. And it was around that time that the documentary Forks Over Knives came out. And she was one of my mommy groups. And she kept telling me, you know, you should watch Forks Over Knives. And I'm like, no, I don't want to. And she just kept being so insistent, but I didn't want to watch it because I knew that if I saw something that I, you know, that really caught my attention or that I was going to try it. And at the time, you know, I was working as a chef. So I was, you know, working with me in animal products and that's what I did. So I didn't want to, but she was so insistent and I'm so thankful that she was because I did end up watching it and I did end up going vegan. I think it took me about maybe a year, a year and a half to finally transition to just dropping all animal products, but it really did improve, improve my health. Great. Well, thank you for going vegan. <laughs> How old are your kids? I have an 11 year old, oh, he's 12, a 12 year old, a seven year old and a four year old. Wow. That's, that's a lot of kids there. So maybe the four year old, I'm guessing is probably the healthiest eater because he was exposed to it from the beginning. Yes, he is. And he, they're not, my kids are not vegan. His, um, their dad is not vegan. So he does introduce them to animal products, but I'm usually the one that cooks at home. So they have to eat what I make. There's no, there's no other choice <laughs> and they have no choice. So they're mostly, mostly plant-based, but yeah, the younger one, I was vegan throughout the pregnancy and he actually prefers, even when he get does get served meat and cheese and stuff like that, he actually just prefers like rice and beans and veggies, like without anybody telling him that's what he likes. Yay. Well, let's, <laughs> let's see, how are we going to get your husband on board? Has he seen Game Changers? Um, actually, did he see that with me? I think he didn't. He didn't see Game Changers. He saw, he did try it. He tried it and he was vegan for about six months. But at the time he was also, he also works in restaurants. 
So that just made it very, very hard, very hard, especially when they were like, oh, you need to, the chef made this, you need to try it and like stuff like that. So I'd be like, oh no, you know? So it, he just kind of felt it was like hindering his work. And, um, and he did it for six months and then he was like, I'm, I'm done. Can't do it anymore. Well, he's, he's veganish at home, right? Yes. <laughs> That's good. And your food's amazing. So, I mean, how, you can't complain about that. No, no, no. And, and my whole family are my, t- my taste testers. So every time I'm testing a recipe, they're the ones, you know, they're like, no, no, I don't like this. You know, I need some more of this. My 12 year old, we tell him that he's going to be like a chef or at least a food critic because he tries anything I make. And he's like, this needs salt. <laughs> funny. That's funny. Everybody's a critic, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. What are some of their favorite dishes that you make? Um, they love these um, flautas. Flautas are in California, they call them um, taquitos, and they're just like rolled corn tortillas, but I like to fill them with mashed potatoes. So I make a mashed potato and I add onion and poblano peppers, like mild peppers, because they eat a little bit of spicy food, and maybe like garlic powder, onion powder, um, smoked paprika, and then I fill the tortillas, and I I air fry them, or you can bake them in the oven, and then we dip them in a like a avocado sauce. Wow, that sounds delicious. Nice. And today you're making ceviche. What is ceviche normally made of? Some kind of fish, right? Yes. Ceviche is usually made of fish. Um, and what it what ceviche is, is that they marinate the fish instead of cooking it. So it's raw fish and they marinate it and the, acid, the acidity and the lime kind of cooks the fish. It doesn't really cook it, but it, it changes the texture and... And then you mix it, you know, like with other stuff. And it's usually you, you eat it in the summer, you eat it on the beach, you know, you put it on tostadas. But today I'm going to make a cauliflower ceviche. And I've made ceviche with several things. There's, I've made it with cauliflower. I've made it with mushrooms, like raw mushrooms actually come out after you marinate them in the lime juice. It has this texture that's like kind of fishy. So it's really interesting with mushrooms. Or I've also used um, hearts of palm to make ceviche. Oh, that sounds good, Hearts of Palm, because they have that kind of, like, texture. Uh-huh. Yeah, nice. So this recipe is super, super, super easy, and I chose uh, cauliflower because, you know, cauliflower is just so, so good for us. And this way, if you don't like cauliflower, you need to try it this way because you're going to like it. You really are. Yeah, that's great. No, I love, I love cauliflower is so neutral. It's like tofu. How can you not like it? It doesn't, it doesn't really have a taste on its own. You can do so many things with it too. I know. And it's cheap. You know, I mean, well, maybe a big head of organic isn't, but I, I love, I love making, you know, you ever make wings out of cauliflower, not wings, but you know how they dip it in, you know, yes. Yeah. Buffalo wings. Yeah, yeah. Those are really good. Yeah. Yeah. They're super good. It's very versatile. So should we, should we get started? Yeah, see the recipe. I can't wait. Your kids. Let me head to my stove really quick to turn up the, the water and I'll walk you through what I'm going to do through the recipe while we wait for our water to boil. So you can do this with raw cauliflower and just mix it in the marinade. I mean, this is going to be more of like a salad. It's going to be super crunchy and it has a lot of lime juice. So it's basically cauliflower with a pico de gallo, which is tomato, onion, um, jalapeno. I like to add cucumbers to it. But I'm going to blanch and shock or cook the cauliflower for a couple minutes because this way it's going to be a little bit cooked, but it'll still be crunchy. So you'll still be able to get a texture out of it. It's not going to be a complete mush, you know, of cauliflower. And then after that, after we boil it for two minutes, we're going to put it in a huge bowl of ice and water, and that's going to stop the cooking process. And that's why we're going to be able to keep our, our cauliflower crunchy. And this method also works like with all vegetables. Like if you want to cook broccoli, and you want it to be bright green, you're going to make a salad. You can do that. You can put it in boiling water for like a minute, take it out, plunge it into ice cold water, and it'll stay green. It'll stop cooking. It'll stay bright, bright, bright green. Yeah. That's the secret. Cause it looks, it, it, it tastes better when it looks better. Yes, that's true. Especially broccoli, especially broccoli. It's very bright and colorful. Yeah, nobody likes gray broccoli. No. <laughs> okay, let's see. Um, let's wait a couple more minutes. You live in Texas, right? Yes. Nice. 
I do live in Texas. And right now I live in a small town on the border uh, with it, of Texas and Mexico, where it has been challenging because I've lived all over the place. And everywhere I go, you know, you, you, when you've been doing this for so long, you find ways of, of adapting, of going to restaurants and being like, I just want steamed potato and like broccoli and like avocado and salsa. <laughs> That's my go-to. I can usually like put it together from any menu. Um, but right here um, on the border, and I'm from Northern Mexico and it's very, very meat heavy. With every single meal has meat in it, breakfast, lunch, dinner, every meal. So it has been a little bit challenging um, being in such a small town and not have a lot of access to, you know, specialty grocery stores. You know, it's just, we have an HEB and a Walmart, but even, even with that, you can do it. Yeah. And I think I try. I wonder if Walmart's I, are consistent like everywhere, because here where I live, the Walmart has so much organic produce. It's so affordable. I mean, we, we get everything here. Yes, Walmart. Uh, actually, this is what, that's where I get most of um, the organic stuff is from Walmart. Surprisingly, it has more of a variety than the other grocery stores. And they have everything. They have tofu. They have all the produce you can think of. And they have, you know, they have some of the packaged um, vegan foods as well. Nice. We have a store here called Winco, and it's amazing how much organic produce they have. And like you say, tofu, tempeh, sprouts. It's, it's uh, you know, I guess it's, it's catching on. Well, we hope. Yeah. Hey, you know right, I, my water. Oh, just ready. Quick, quick question. Remember the wonderful dish you made on the Iron Chef? Did you ever make it again? No, I haven't. But you know what? I need to write that recipe down because it turned out really good. It, it did? turned out really good. And I love working with the masarina because you can make, you know, I think I made sopes that day, but you can also make gorditas. You can make so many things and it's so easy. It's just the, the masarina and water. And that's it. I know that's really cool. Do you ever make your own tortillas? You know, I it's kind of like the tortillas are kind of my nemesis <laughs> because I could never, you know, I can make them. I can make them, but you know, like the ultimate test to see, to, you know, like to tell that you're like a tortilla master in Mexico, you say that once you can do, once your tortilla inflates on the comal, you can get married. <laughs> oh my god that's hilarious I love that I, you know I took a tortilla making class once in a Mexican restaurant we did flour not corn and it, it, you know it's an art yes so I can never get my tortillas to inflate but, so that's why I've never done like a class or anything like I can make them and they come out really good but they don't inflate and I just feel kind of like no <laughs> how, did, how did you get married then that's uh you know, <laughs> yeah. I bypass that law <laughs> um, yeah I know um, <laughs> Lauren wants to know, what do you use as a chicken or beef replacement for people who are new to plant-based eating? Her husband is finally ready. Yay, hubby. Yay. You know, my favorite one right now is soy curls. They have a texture that is very similar. I don't want to say similar to meat, but it kind of gives you that mouthfeel. And they're also like tofu where they absorb all of the flavors. So that, that is one of my favorites. And my husband, who is an omnivore, he likes it as well whenever, whenever we prepare soy curls. After that, my, all, my whole household loves tofu. We mm. love tofu. We make it every single way we can. We make tofu scrambles. We make, I, am, I made like tofu nuggets for the kids. Like we can make it any single way. It's so, it's so versatile. Yeah, I find that jackfruit's a great substitute for chicken. Yeah, jackfruit is a really good one too. I just, a lot of people, I feel they don't really know how to prepare it. Cause you know, if you buy the canned version, it has that like briny taste and that puts people off a little bit. But just a quick tip, you can simmer it. Simmer it in water, put like an onion and garlic in there and simmer it for like 10 minutes, really slowly. And that's gonna get some of that briny taste out and then you can use it in the recipes that you, that you need. Nice. If you want to get something you need, I'll just read a comment from Claudia. I made tamales last Christmas using Dora's recipe. Thank you, Dora. Love your recipes. Oh, my tamales. That, that's a, a recipe. My father owns a restaurant here in, in Mexico. Well, I'm not in Mexico, but in Mexico. <laughs> and, um, and that's the recipe from his restaurant. And I've made them with, with jackfruit. Nice. Okay. So I've got my cauliflower here. And it's cut into florets and they're not, they're not terribly tiny, like a good size. And what we're going to do is we're just going to put it in the boiling water 
And we're going to wait like one or two minutes. And then for those of you that are interested in, in the tamales, the, I have an, an ebook on Amazon. It's called Vegan Tamales Unwrapped. And all of the recipes are savory and sweet tamales. And all the recipes have an oil-free option. So if you never had tamales without fat, you can use an unsweetened pumpkin puree to substitute the fat in the, in the dough of the tamal. And they come out so, so good. They're still, they're still tender. You know, they're a little bit more dense than tamales made with fat but they're still very delicious and you can fill them with anything that you like, all sorts of veggies, beans, you know, put some salsa on top and it's so, so good. Okay. Was that a minute? <laughs> What's the name of your dad's uh, restaurant and what part of Mexico is it in? My dad's restaurant is called Los Tacos Grill and it's in a town called Acuña, which is right on the border with Texas. And that's where I grew up. And my father's restaurant has been open for about 30 years. And ironically, it's a steakhouse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a steakhouse. We're trying, to, we're trying to like offer some like vegan or vegetarian options, but just people, they're, they're like meat, meat eaters. Are there any vegan options on your dad's menu? Yes, and then the chefs, because um, now that I live close, close to home, um, the chefs know how to do it. So if somebody comes and says, Hey, I'm a vegetarian. Can you make me something like they can make, they make the very good vegan enchiladas. They make like a very good chile relleno. That's not, um, deep fried and it's filled with veggies. So, so they know, they know, but it's just the, the actual customers are just not, not interested. <laughs> Okay, so it's been two minutes and I'm taking my cauliflower and I'm putting it in a huge bowl of ice water. And we're gonna wait a little bit to make sure that it's cold. We want it to be really cold. Let's get all the little things in there. Let's move back. There you go. Okay, and then I'm gonna show you really quick the rest of my ingredients. I'm gonna go down here. So I've got about a cup of diced cucumber. I have some diced tomato and you can, I decided not to take out the pulp, but if you want this to last in the fridge for a couple of days, maybe like two days, take out the, the middle of the tomato so that the pulp isn't there and that'll keep it from, from spoiling quicker. And then I've got cilantro, chopped cilantro and then lime juice. I have onion and the onion, if you're not a huge fan of raw onion, you can soak, chop up your onion and then soak it in water for like five or six minutes. And that'll take off some of that like strong flavor of the raw onion, but you'll still get the crunch. And then I also have jalapeno. And we're gonna put salt. Now you can put as much jalapeno, or you know, you can also use uh, serrano peppers, which are spicier than jalapenos, and that's up to you. Or if you're not, you don't eat spicy food, then you could just omit them. It's not, it's not a big deal. Jalapenos are so good. Yes, they're so good. And you know, if you want to use jalapenos and you you like spicy, but maybe not that spicy. I didn't take out the seeds because I like spicy, but you can take out the seeds and the veins of the chile. And then also, if it's still too spicy, soak it in water as well. Soak it in like five or six minutes, and that'll also take out some of the spiciness. I, have you ever used jalapeno powder? I put that on things, uh, you know, because I, no, I do. I haven't. It, it's great because sometimes I don't know if I buy a bag they go bad if I don't use them fast enough, but the powder gives everything a little kick. I put it on my salads. I really like jalapeno powder. Mm. And where do you get that? Costco. Oh, yeah. really? Yeah, it's a big bottle from Costco. And I'm sure local spicery and other places have it, but I really like, I really like it. That's good. All right. So my cauliflower is now cold, very cold. And I'm just going to drain it really quick in the sink. All 
Okay, it's ready. So now what we're gonna do, if you could see it, so you can see that it's it's cooked, but it's not completely mushed. Like I, I press it and it doesn't, you know, smush. So what we're gonna do right now is chop it up. And how fine you want to chop it up is gonna depend on you. I like to chop it pretty finely because it kind of looks like fish, you know, because it's white and then it'll give you like the little, like the little pieces. So I'll show you really quickly right here. But if you want to keep it whole and it'll be more like a salad, you know, that, that can also work. So like, this is good. So can me point it down right here. So you can see like the pieces. Now, again, when you mix it all together, it kind of gives like the impression of it being fish. <laughs> Do you ever put anything fishy in it like kelp or dulse to give it like a sea flavor? Today, I'm not going to do that, but if you like fishy, you know, because ceviche is made with fish, if you like the fishy flavor, dulce powder is really good. Or if I don't have it, because I don't, if that's not available to me here locally, or I have to order it from Amazon, I use, you know, the nori seaweed that you use to make sushi. I put it in the blender. You could put it in the blender and make a powder. And then I add it to my ceviches or I have a recipe on my site for um, almost like a shrimp cocktail that's made out of hearts of palm and artichokes. And I, I'll add it to that. Well, that sounds fabulous. I'm going to check out that recipe. And that's a great idea because I have nori, but I don't make sushi. So I should just crumble it and then use it as a spice. Yes. And it works and it's fishy. I mean, it's seaweed. It's, it's fishy. <laughs> so no Trader Joe's, Costco or Whole Foods by you, huh? Nothing. The closest one is three hours away. And we go about once a month. We go to San Antonio, Texas. And we do, I'll do all, you know, like my shopping, I'll get nuts. I'll get, you know, because um, when you, you don't even think about it, when you live in a big city and you can, you have access to all this stuff, but when you're in a small city and you really can't get a whole lot of stuff, especially specialty, specialty stuff. Mm -hmm. I guess there's stuff you could order probably online, right? Yeah, I order a lot um, from Amazon. Yep. So Joanne says you can make your own jalapeno powder with chilies that are quickly moving past their prime, dehydrate them and throw them in the high-speed blender. Thanks. That's a very Ooh, great idea. Thank you. That's a great tip. Oh, and here's an interesting comment from Claudia. I make a vegan ceviche using hominy instead of fish. That's a great idea. That is also a great idea. I'm going to have to try that. I love hominy. Yeah, it's, well, that's how you make pozole. Yeah, there's also a pozole recipe on our site. There's actually two, red pozole and green, or rojo and verde. And I love to make it with either jackfruit or oyster mushrooms. It turns out really good. Let's keep chopping. Okay, okay, okay. I've also made a sort of ceviche with potatoes. If you cook baby potatoes, and then especially the ceviche that's tomato based, that's very good with baby potatoes. If you cook the potatoes until they're, they're not completely mush, but just a little bit tender. And then you mix it with the ceviche marinade. And I add cucumber and tomato and avocado to it. It's really good. I can't see it, but it looks like you have good knife skills. Here. You always want to see? Let's see. <laughs> My 12-year-old son loves doing this. I'm like, stop it. You're going to cut off your finger. But he's totally old enough to learn now to cook. We're just afraid that he's going to be like, I want to be a chef. Because he's so smart. He's, he should be like an engineer or like something crazy like that. But... <laughs> Are you saying chefs aren't smart? <laughs> oh, no, no. Chefs are smart. But, you know, the industry is just, it's tough. It's tough to work in restaurants. Oh, I tell me about it. I did it five years. And it's you know, people like, oh, you open a restaurant. It's like, that's like the last yeah. thing I want to do. I know. People ask me all the time. They're like, we love your recipes. You should open a restaurant. I'm like, nope, 
no thank you <laughs> it's, it's so much hard, work it's such hard work and people are hungry and they're cranky and it's just yeah. so yep oh man especially right now restaurants are having such a hard time after the the pandemic yeah, I think I think where I live, you have to show a vaccine card to eat inside. I don't, I don't know. Like, really? I don't, I don't go to restaurants, so it doesn't affect me, but I think that's the case. Let's see, what else? Well, the easiest thing about Mexican cuisine is tacos. I make absolutely everything into a taco. If that, it, it doesn't matter what veggie I have. If you put it on a tortilla and you add sauce to it, it's a taco. <laughs> you know, I, I agree. We have, well, we have tostadas instead. And the reason is, Dora, is because tacos, you got to turn your head. You know what I'm saying? Like you, and it's, I, I, have, I have TMJ and it's like, oh, it hurts to turn my head. So we eat tostadas. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Three or four nights a week. I, that is my favorite. But we just don't do the shells into taco shape. You know what I mean? But same, yeah. it's the same principle. Yeah, it's the same thing. But those it's are my favorite. Thing. You can't go wrong. Anything can be a taco. Like you say, sweet potatoes can be a taco. Black yes. potatoes, anything can be a taco. Okay, we're good. This is also a really good kitchen tip. This is a bench scraper and it's used for pastries. But I like to use it to instead of like grabbing a little bit and putting it in my bowl, grabbing a little bit, putting it in my bowl, just grab the whole thing, put it in your bowl. <laughs> I have one of those. I should use it. I don't know what they're called though, but like scraper or they're called a bench scraper. Nice. Okay. All right, I'm trying to get it so you can see my face and see the bowl at the same time. <laughs> so I've got my cauliflower and we are just going to add our veggies. So I've got cucumber, like I mentioned, cucumber. I've got tomato, my onion, and I soaked my onion for a little bit. And cilantro, and cilantro, this is about a quarter of a cup. And I know some people are not big fans of cilantro, but you can put in as much cilantro as you want or no cilantro at all. So I'm gonna start off putting half of the jalapeno I have here, just cause you never know how hot it is. <laughs> Test it out. So for the cilantro haters in the room, we can omit it, right? Yes, you can omit it. And we've got lime juice. And Mexicans love, love, love lime juice. We eat so much lime juice on everything. Wakes everything okay. up. Yes. And then I've got a little bit of salt. And then we're going to mix it. And you want this to marinate in the, in the fridge at least 30 minutes to, you know, to let it absorb like all of the flavors. And it'll keep in your fridge for one or two days, but two days, especially if you take out the pulp of the tomato before dicing it, it'll last, it'll last longer. Okay. So I'm going to try it just to make sure that it's spicy enough. If it's not spicy enough, I'm going to add the rest of the, of the jalapeno. Good. It's crunchy. That's really good. I am going to add the rest of the jalapeno. How close are you to Mexico? Like minutes, miles? Yeah, I'm like right, right on the border. This is where I grew up. I grew up, I'm from Acuna, which is on the Mexican side. I live in Del Rio now, Del Rio, Texas, which is the American side. And it's separated by a bridge, like literally... You cross a bridge and you're on the other. I mean, you have to go through immigration, obviously. But <laughs> you cross a bridge and you're on the other side. Can, can you go to Mexico? I mean, are you able to go back and forth? Yes. Oh, how nice. So you can see your dad. Yeah, yeah. Um, I help out at the restaurant uh, every once in a while when when they need me. Oh. Because um, it's, it's, you know, I grew up 
really in the restaurant business, my dad has had this business for 30 years. So that's also why one of the reasons why I'm, you want to open a restaurant. I'm like, nope, nope, no. Nope. <laughs> like we know firsthand everything that it takes to, to keep a restaurant running for that long. But it's just, I live close to family now. My parents are right across the border. So it's really, it's really, really nice to, um, to have them be so close and to have Mexico close because there's things like tortillas or avocados or even tomatoes that the just driving across the border, they change so much. The can flavor. You, can you bring produce back across? You can bring some produce, not all of it. For example, avocados, you can bring them over, but you need to take out the pit. They don't want you to cross the seed. So if you take out the pit, you can cross it over. So if I do go into Mexico for like a day trip, I'll, you know, pick up avocados and cut them in half and take out the seed and like wrap them in plastic wrap. And then I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, I can cross them over. So there's, there's a list that in, um, immigration has that tells you what produce you can cross and what you can't. That's interesting. Apple says she loves your top. Thank you. It was a gift from my mom. I think it's from Yucatan. I'm not sure where where she brought it from. Yeah, I've been to Mexico twice just in the last few weeks. I uh, I teach at a spot called Rancho La Puerta. It's fabulous. That's great. I want to go. <laughs> oh, no, apply! I, I mean, I wish I could help get you in. It's like oh, it's even for me to get in sometimes. So <laughs> it is. It is a beautiful place. Is there a waiting list? Well, and not re- it's just so complicated. I can't explain. It's not a waiting list to go if you will pay, but to be a, uh-huh. an instructor, it's like, that. you know, everybody wants to go because you don't have to pay when you're a, just oh, like a machine. You can apply to be an instructor. Right, you can apply. Yeah, it took, it took a while. Oh, I'm like, oh. <laughs> well, hey, you never know, but it's, it's in Tecate, though. So that's probably not super close to you, is it? No, it's not. It's not. Yeah, you'd have to travel somehow. If you can get to San Diego, you can get to Rancho. It's funny because it actually takes less time for me to drive to Mexico than it does to drive to Los Angeles where I live now. So go figure. Especially since LA traffic is so bad. Oh my God. It's like a parking lot. I just, I I, I hope I don't have to go back to LA. (laughs) (laughs) I left that. uh, So uh, our ceviche is basically done. You just have to let it marinate for a little bit. And I like to have it on these they're tostadas that they sell in the shape of crackers and they're baked they're not they don't have any oil at all they sell them at HEV so I like to have them with that and with some guacamole I got right guacamole right here you can eat this in tostadas or you can mix this with salad and make it into a salad you can, this is a really good thing to take, like to take to lunch to work because it's so good, especially right right here in Texas, it's still really hot. So if it's super hot, this is very refreshing. How long will it last in the refrigerator? It'll last uh, like two days in the fridge. That's great. It wasn't too hard to prepare. No, no, it's really, really, really easy. It's really easy. You don't what? you don't have to like do much to it. Uh, Jerry loves your bowls and your dishes. Oh, thank you. I wonder if you could use frozen cauliflower in a pinch to frost it. I wonder if that would be the right texture. You know, I've never tried it with with frozen cauliflower, but I don't see, especially you know how they sell the one to make cauliflower rice. I think that would work. You know, I bet it would work with rice cauliflower. Mm-hmm. It sounds really good. Well, thanks. This has been a really fun, easy recipe. Healthy, delicious, oil-free. It's salt-free, unless you add salt, of course, you know. Super, super easy. Yeah, great. So anything you've got planned coming up? I mean, I we have put all the links to your wonderful books in the show notes. Um, do you teach any classes? Is there any other? Yes, I've just restarted my virtual cooking classes. So I have a class. I'm going to do once. I do a class a month once a month and this month it's on september 18th at 11 a.m central time and we're making a dish called chiles and nogada and chiles and nogada is a very very traditional mexican dish it's a stuffed poblano peppers and it's traditionally stuffed with a picadillo 
but I make my picadillo out of lentils. And this dish is really, really special because it's kind of savory and sweet. The picadillo has apples, pears, raisins, almonds, plantain, and it has cinnamon, clove. It's a very um, special dish that we used to celebrate Mexico's independence. And then you top it with a walnut cream sauce, which in my case, it's just a walnut, like a vegan uh, nut sauce. And then you top it with pomegranate, pomegranate seeds. So it's really colorful. The flavors are just, I don't think you can find this particular combina combination of flavors in any other dish. It's did super, you, super special. That sounds great. Did you give me the link to that to put in the show notes about your class? Yes, you did. Virtual yes. cooking classes. Person. Perfect. That's wonderful. Uh, here's a question. How do you choose a ripe poblano pepper? You really want to make sure that they're fresh, that they're not old. And if they're old, they're going to be wrinkly. Like a fresh poblano or a fresher poblano, because we don't really know how much, how long they've been in the trucks. Um, the skin isn't wrinkled at all. Like it, it's bumpy. It could be bumpy, but it's not wrinkled. An old poblano pepper will start kind of, to kind of shrink and it'll start to wrinkle and you might see some soft spots. So you just want to make sure, especially if you're going to make chile relleno, that it's a good size because once you roast it, it's kind of, it's going to kind of, you know, collapse on itself and be soft. So you want to make sure that it's large enough to have your filling put in. And then if it's like that, if it's fresh, then it's going to be really, really good. And if you're roasting poblano peppers, a really good tip is to not over roast them. If you're, especially if you're trying to make a uh, stuffed chile, you really only want to roast them to take off the skin. You don't want to have it be completely soft and like collapse on itself because then you won't be able to fill it. It'll be so soft that you won't be able to put the filling inside. That's good to know. That'd be fun to do a class on all different chiles and salsas. I would take that one. Oh Same my goodness. Time. Salsas are just, there's so many, so many salsas and you could put salsa on anything and it would be good. Tell me about it. Yeah, and you, you know the brown one? I, I don't know what it's called, but it's it's not mole, but it's like it's with the darker chilies. That's my favorite. Yeah, there's um there's a lot of them that are made if they're made with the dried chiles, like there's one one of my favorites was made with chile morita, which is a really small, smoky chile similar to a dried chipotle pepper. And you kind of make like a salsa verde with tomatillos and onion, but you use this pepper and it turns into like a dark reddish color. And that's very good. Yeah, I love those. That's great. Let's see if there's any more questions. for You, you want to talk about your different books? Yes, I have my tamal ebook um, and it has eight, over 18 different tamal recipes, savory and sweet. And if you've never tried sweet tamales, they are very, very good. You mix in, and when you make the masa, you mix in like fruit purees. So if you're making strawberry tamales, you'll make your, your masa with the corn flour and in, in our case, oil free with the unsweetened pumpkin, a little bit of sugar, and then you add uh, like strawberry puree. And that's going to turn the masa like a pinkish color. In Mexico, they add food coloring. So it's like super bright pink, but you don't need to. And then you fill it with like strawberry jam or fresh strawberries or like a strawberry compote. And then you, you know, you, you spread them and you steam them. And they're very, very good. I don't think a lot of people have tried sweet tamales, but it just, you know, corn goes so well sweet. So it yeah. just makes sense. Oh, you bet. Uh, Claudia has the book. She says it's fabulous. And there's another question. When you're choosing poblanos, are darker colors better? Not necessarily. You really have to see that the skin is not wrinkled, that they're firm. Um, the color could change, I think, um, with their exposure, like how they're, they're planted and harvested and all that stuff. But it, culinary wise, it doesn't really, really matter. Great, thanks. And there's a question. What's your favorite taco meat replacement from Jackie? My favorite taco meat replacement? Well, it depends what kind of taco you're making. So if you're trying to, and especially who I'm serving it to. So for example, if I was serving tacos to my husband, then I would probably use soy curls or maybe TVP, like textured vegetable protein. If I was trying to make something like chicken, then I would use um, jackfruit 
or soy curls again. But have you ever had shredded soy curls, Chef AJ? I have it because I'm allergic to soy, so I miss out on. Oh, okay. It. But does that does that do? You know, I saw somebody a raw chef came on this week, and she she shredded like I think it was oyster mushrooms, and I'm like, wow, that's pretty cool. I never saw anybody do that before. Yeah, I think one of that's one of my favorite um, meat substitutes is oyster mushrooms because they do when you pull them like this, they shred. So you can shred them and then saute them. And the only time it's a problem if it's somebody doesn't like mushrooms, then they're like, oh no. But for especially people who are doing whole food plant based that love um, all different kinds of vegetables, like mushrooms are such a good, good substitute. And I use it to make tacos. I put it in tamales. I put, make it, I use it to make pozole. I've made mole and then poured it over like a mixture of mushrooms and potatoes and like hearty, like starchy vegetables. And it comes out really good. That sounds great. What are your favorite go-to foods on a daily basis? Do you eat similar breakfasts, lunches kind of things? And I, do, you, do you have to, I guess you have to make all three meals for your kids every day, right? Yes. Um, in the morning, our go-to would be oatmeal. The kids can really like oatmeal or not. I'll, I'll try to make um, vegan waffles or pancakes on the weekend. I'll make a lot of them and then I'll save them. And then like when we were going to, you know, have to rush to go to school in the morning, we'll just kind of like pop one in the toaster or something, get it hot and some fruit. That's like probably the quickest with the kids really have to do quick, quick meals, like easy meals that I know they'll eat. Um, but one of them is oatmeal. I love oatmeal in the morning or overnight oats. Or if I'm going to try um, for something more substantial, I'll do a tofu scramble, like a Mexican style tofu scramble. I saute onion, garlic, jalapeno, tomato, and then I add my tofu to it. And I'll add garlic powder, onion powder, a little bit of turmeric. And I mix a little bit of mustard with water. And then I put it in there. And then I serve it, I'll eat it with like refried beans or non-refried beans, <laughs> uh, refried beans, salsa, and tortillas. And that's, that's, that's one of my favorites. That sounds great. There's a question if you have a recipe for sweet corn tamales in your book. I do, yes. And those are made with fresh corn. So um, most of the tamales are made with the corn flour, which is the nix. I can't say it in English. It's the nixtamalized corn flour, but the sweet tamales, they're made by just kind of pureeing corn, like fresh corn in the blender. And then you make kind of like a dough with that and put it on your corn husks. Great thing. I just have to take a moment to thank Kathy for her super chat donation. She wrote a very fun comment. She said, I love Mexican vegan food. Thank you for all the tips. Dora is adorable and get it. <laughs> Your name was capitalized like yeah. adorable. Very cool. And let's see. I saw a question from Joanne, oyster mushrooms or king oyster mushrooms for shredding. I didn't know there was a difference. King oyster mushrooms are bigger. Um, oyster mushrooms are a little bit smaller, but both of them will work. The King oyster mushrooms do shred more, you know, you'll get like longer shreds. Wow. But uh, both of them will work. Nice. Oh, and if anybody has seen JL, who's usually in the chat, I forgot to thank her for her super chat donation yesterday. Because whenever it's a doctor, I get like nervous about ringing the bell, you know, that's just, <laughs> and not everybody understands what it is. I didn't even know what it is either until somebody had given it to me. And somebody saying, can you use hearts of palm as a meat substitute? I, I think more as a fish than a meat though, right? Yes. Well, hearts of palm are more commonly used as a, as a fish substitute, but have you ever tried hearts of sauteing hearts of palm? I haven't. I, I know I've used them and I like, I've used them instead of um, mozzarella sticks. And that's how I'd have used them for is like to make mozzarella sticks. Oh, that's a good idea. I don't think they're, because they're kind of flaky. I don't think they'd be a good meat substitute. That's why they're mostly used to substitute fish. Right. So here's a question from Melissa. Is there an easy chipotle and adobo swap? They seem time consuming because in the cans, it's delicious, but they always have sugar, salt or oil. One of the three, you know. Um, well, the to make the chipotles and adobo is really not that you. The hardest part is to find the chipotle, the, the dried chipotle peppers. That's probably the hardest part. 
the rest of the stuff, it's really kind of making a sauce, an adobo sauce and pouring it on there, kind of reconstituting, reconstituting the cheese. But if you want the chipotle taste, but don't want to make the whole like adobo thing, you can use a dry chipotle. Like if you're making a sauce and you wanted to make it a chipotle sauce, all you have to do is get your dry chipotle pepper and put it in hot water for 10, 10 minutes and then blend it with your sauce. And you don't need chipotle in adobo. Nice, thanks. Uh, Apple says, do you have an atole, or if I pronounce that correctly, recipe? Yes, there's on my site, there's an atole almendrado, which is an almond atole on there. And I think I also have champurrado, which is, which is basically a chocolate atole. And an atole is a beverage made with the corn flour, the, the corn masa. And you basically boil water and add the, the, the masarina, the corn flour to it, and then simmer it until it gets to like a, a thicker consistency. And it's like a winter drink. It's like so comforting because it's like thick, but it's like corn and you can add, so you can add puree fruit to it. So you can have strawberry atole, you can have um, guayaba, like guava atole. There's all kinds of different flavors. And they're actually usually served with tamales. So in the winter, you'll have your tamales and your atole. Nice. I never heard of that. Well, great. Thank you so much. That This was wonderful. I, le I learned so much. And I love that. Hey, I have an idea. How about November 1st, World Vegan Day? We ask your dad's restaurant to go vegan just for the day. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> wow. I have to discuss that with my dad. <laughs> or, just, or have a vegan option just for World Vegan Day or something. Yeah. Nice. Well, That's thank you really so much. It's, it's great catching up with you. This I'm going to definitely make this recipe because I am just such a fan of cauliflower. Well, let me show you really quick how to eat it. So you got your ceviche and you can have tostadas or like mine are like tostada crackers almost. Did and you make I'm those? Just... Oh, Dora, did you make those? No, I got these at HEB. Now, what, what are you saying? HTV? Is that what it's called? HEB, like H. I don't know what it stands for, but it's like the major, like the biggest grocery store in, in Texas. I'll show you the box really quick. Because we have a brand Guerrero that has no oil and minimal salt. We have to talk, so it will. Oh, yeah. it, um, it's called Horneaditas. They're modeled after a Mexican brand. That in California, you might be able to get the actual Mexican brand. It's called Sanissimo. And they make a line of, baked corn tostadas like these are shaped into crackers but they're it's just like a tostada but it's just shaped like a cracker and they come in a really convenient well, probably not earth friendly but like if you're on the go and you want to take your <laughs> your tostada cracker that sounds I, I would love to try that brand is, and is it low salt um Oh, well, this one has 80 milligrams of salt for three crackers. That's not, that's, that's pretty good. That's great. Yeah. Uh, I'll send I, you the, yeah, send me a picture. Maybe we have them and I just haven't looked. Cause we have a lot of, you know, like uh, ethnic markets here. So maybe it's there and I just looked at the wrong aisle. Cause that's so cool. Thank you. Okay. Let's go. Let's keep going. <laughs> and then you just put your ceviche on top. And that's it. That's it. That's it. Oh my, oh my God. That looks amazing and it sounds amazing. Yeah. People are asking if you could spell the brand of Cracker. Like, could you spell the name on the box and I'll type it in the chat? Let After me type it in the chat. Oh, you can do it. Great. I didn't know you could see the chat because a lot of the guests say they can't. So, well, I can see the chat on Zoom. I can't see the chat on. Oh, I see what you're saying. You can't see the YouTube chat. So if you guys want to talk about her, it's okay. No, I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just I am just. Okay. Is so that... I'll spell it out. In Spanish, this is a brand that you can only get in HGB. This one that I have right now. But the Mexican brand, I, I know I found it in California when I used to live in California. So you might be able to find that one. And it's called Sanísimo. S-A-N-I-S-I-M-O. Okay, I'm going to look it up. Sanissimo, thank you. Yeah, I don't think we have an H-E-B here. I haven't heard of it. No, I think they're only in Texas. 
Nice. Now, I also wanted to mention, I have an ebook and I also sent you the link. It's called Our Vegan Mexico. And this was a project that I did with other vegan, um, Mexican vegan and Mexican American uh, chefs and bloggers and influencers. And everybody submitted a recipe, each rep recipe representing a state uh, in the Mexican Union. So there's 32 recipes and each recipe is represented. For example, I'm from Coahuila. So there's my recipe for Coahuila is a, di a dish called discada that is very popular here in Coahuila. So then every state has its own recipe representing it. And it's completely free. It's a project that we wanted to do to be able to kind of unite the, the vegan Mexican community with the vegan community in Mexico. And also to kind of get, you know, all um, Mexican people to kind of see that you can be Mexican and you can be vegan and you can still, you know, honor your traditions and eat with your family and still have pozole on Christmas and, you know, all this stuff that sometimes, especially for Mexican culture, where you think if food is such an important part of our culture, it really is like it brings and in every culture food brings you together but in Mexican culture food is just a thing it's, it's a pride like we take so much pride in our cuisine we take so much pride in our mother's recipes our grandmother's recipes like we pass them on from generation to generation so when somebody is faced with the choice of whether to go vegan or not or plant-based or not it's kind of kind of heart-wrenching and you're like am I gonna have to never make my family recipes again so this is a, a a special project that we did to be able to show people that you can, you can still make your family's recipes. You can still be part of your culture. You can still, you know, honor your ancestry and your traditions without using any animal products at all. Great. Well, thank you. Thanks for being vegan. And thanks for introducing people to delicious Mexican vegan cuisine. It was great to be here, Chef AJ. Right. Anytime. We'd love to have you back. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow when we go from Mexico to India, when we have a wonderful YouTuber named Harshdeep Swami, who's going to be making an oil-free vegan curry. Do you ever eat other ethnicities of food? You know, here in town, we don't have a lot of variety, but I myself, I went to culinary school. So I know how to prepare a lot of stuff. So here at home, we do make, you know, my husband is half Korean. So we do a lot of Asian food, um, Thai food, Chinese food, Korean food. And then I love Indian food. So I also make a little bit of Indian food. So, so the kids do get to eat a lot of different um, um, cuisines of different countries. That sounds great. Thanks so much, Doris. A pleasure hosting you. Take care. Okay.